And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, today we're continuing in the question and answer series, and I'm going to try to address a very important and a very complex question. If God is good, why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? On the slide, on the screen behind me is a best-selling book called Where is God in a Messed Up World? You can kind of hear the tone, kind of hear the hurt, even in the title. The Bible is full of stories of people who have difficult times. There's a story of Ruth and how she lost her husband and David lost a child. It's a story of the slaughter of infants in the days of Moses and in the days of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, a good man, had significant physical problems. He described it as a thorn in the flesh. He was shipwrecked, he was starved, he was stoned, he was whipped, he was falsely accused, he was arrested, he was imprisoned, he was beheaded. Why did he have it so hard? The Bible has a lot to say about suffering and heartache. I know so many people here have been through it. On October 22, 1994, a good man named Roger Kistler, he was a paramedic and at work at the fire department, and he realized that he had forgotten something from his home that was just a few miles away, so he called home, and his teenage daughter picked up, and he said, "Hun, I, I forgot something. Can you bring it down to the station? And she said, sure, Dad. And a few minutes later, the station got a call, and so he kind of got his gear together and rushed out with everyone else, and he got on the scene, saw a bunch of fire, and there was an accident. A drunk driver had blown through a stoplight and hit a car broadside, and everything was just a crumpled up mess and a bunch of flames. And it wasn't until he was right there that he realized that it was his car and his daughter. And she had been hit by this drunk driver who, incidentally, was just fine, but she was dead. And he cried out. He said, God, why did this happen? How could it have happened? I, I've done my part. I, I go to church. I give my money. I say my prayers. What, how could this happen to me? Roger Kistler was a good man. He was thinking about going into the ministry, becoming a chaplain for the force. And for months, he was just in agony. Couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, had to quit his work. He couldn't understand why God couldn't have just changed things just a little. The guy had blown through that stop sign. If he would have just slowed his daughter down for two seconds, if she would have taken just one more phone call, or if she would have been just two seconds ahead of things, then she would have been safe. God, is it too much to ask that you would give my daughter just two seconds? God, if you're really good, if you're really powerful, can't you do something small like that? Have you ever asked God those kinds of hard questions? Why does a good God allow bad things to happen? It's a very difficult question to answer. Someone described it as a spider web. You've got this grand web. You touch any of the strings and everything moves. And I think the answer to that question is is complex. It's like a lot of contributing factors coming together and impacting the answer. But I think we need to have some kind of answer. We need to have some kind of response because we have been enlightened. We have been given a help. We have been given the truth. And the world is looking to the church for answers. They may not know it. They may not really understand it. They may not say, I I know you are a Christian. Do you have an answer? But the world is looking for answers. And we have a tremendous opportunity to be a light and to give a response. 1 Peter 3.15 says, We are to honor Christ and let him be the Lord of our life. And this is how. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. Being able to have a good answer to that tough question will help you to be a good witness. And not only will it help you to be a good witness, but it will help you to be able to live a good life. The question, if God is good, why do bad things happen? I think before we really answer that question, we need to back up a little bit. And there is a point of order The truth is, the reality is, there are no good people. 
We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. We are all guilty. We are all unworthy. God has set the standard here, and none of us have met the bar. None of us have done all that we were supposed to do. The truth is, all of us have willfully, knowingly rejected God and his plan and his will and his way. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. And so we really need to turn this question around a little bit and really ask the question, why does God do any good at all? For we are all, we are all bad. 1 John 1.8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. There is no truth in us. So that we have received any good thing, that's a mark of grace. And sometimes when bad things happen, we cry out to God and say, God, this isn't fair. God, I want justice. Well, No, we don't. We really don't want justice. Because if we got justice, we would get the wrath of God. Because that's what we deserve. We don't want justice. We want mercy. God is good. But bad things do happen. I think there's four possibilities as to why bad things happen. And I think only one is is plausible. So let's kind of go through the scenarios. Number one, bad things happen because God is not there. If there is no God, it doesn't really matter. Everything is in a state of chaos and random things happen. It just kind of comes your way every now and then. But that doesn't feel right to me. I, I look at the, the scope, the nature, the dimensions, the dynamics of the universe, and I see the fingerprints of God. I see evidence of some kind of master designer, whether it's the huge things or whether it's the smallest microscopic things. There's precision. There's order there. It, it speaks to a grand designer. We call him God. In Jesus Christ. God is there. Humanity is drawn toward God. Every culture has a belief in God. Every person has this kind of God-shaped void within them. This sense of morality. This innate feeling of right and wrong. I don't have to read in the Bible to know that murder is bad. I just kind of feel it. I think that's a God spark. There's a God presence in all of us. The word says the light of God has appeared to all people. I think that's this God spark, this consciousness. It's the evidence of God. So this this doesn't feel right. It doesn't make sense to me that God is just not there. The second scenario is that bad things happen because God himself is bad. And so it would just make sense that bad things would come from a bad God. But that doesn't make sense to me either because where would goodness or mercy or kindness or gentleness come from? And bad, by definition, is destructive, but God, by definition, is creator. So you've got this dichotomy. How can you have this this war of good and evil, of creator and destructor all bound into one? It just doesn't make sense. I think God is, is not bad. God is good. A third possibility is that God is good, but God is weak. So, I mean, he doesn't like the bad, but he can't do anything about it. The problem with that scenario is that at some point you have to ask Where do the bad things come from, and why is it that God is weaker than the bad? And that doesn't really make sense, because if God is God, then he's all-powerful. How could something be more powerful than the all-powerful? That that doesn't quite make sense. What is strongest is God, and God is good. So that scenario doesn't make sense. But fortunately, there is one other scenario, and And it really takes this statement and it changes the question, if God is good, why do bad things happen? And it kind of makes a statement or a promise out of it. And this is what I think we need to hold on to, the truth that God is good even when bad things happen. That God is good even when bad things happen. And I know it's hard to understand and I don't mean to minimize your hurt, but I think we need to talk about this. I I think it's possible to get angry with God, to not understand God, and to hold things against God, resentments or something like this. But my inability to understand God and how he works and his timetable for things, that doesn't change who he is. God doesn't need my permission to do the things that he does. He doesn't need my understanding to be who he is. He just is. His goodness doesn't depend on whether or not I believe that he's good. He's just good. He's God. You see, my understanding about God doesn't change who he is. It doesn't change the way God's going to live his life, but it will change the way that I'm going to be able to live my life. Because if I understand that God is good, even when the bad things happen, then I will have more of a peace, more of a contentment, more of a strength, more of an ability to persevere and hang on even when the bad things come. 
I want to share five reasons why God is good. Not empirical truths, but things to hold on to when you go through those tough times. Five reasons to believe. Number one, God is good because all that he created is good. You look in creation, you see the beauty of it. This is kind of a complex thing because the truth is, woven into the fabric of all of creation are very dynamic, powerful, even lethal forces. We need the sun, we need its radiation. Get too close though, it will kill you. We need gravity to exist, but jump off of a high place, you won't survive. We need water, but go out into the deep water, you may drown. So there are lethal forces. We like, we like Yosemite, but it took very powerful forces. Maybe some earthquakes, maybe avalanches, maybe glaciers moving through. Very powerful forces have moved, and in time, may that be what it is today. So we need to respect those powerful forces and believe that they are good, they are necessary, they provide, uh, maybe even beyond, in a way that's beyond our understanding. They provide what is essential for existence as we know it. All that God created is good. God created a perfect world, a beautiful world, a beautiful universe. God didn't create the bad. The bad came later. What God has brought about is good. And the Bible says that every good thing that you have ever received, every good blessing in your life, that has come to you as a gift from God. Good things come from God. The second thing that reminds me of the goodness of God is that it is his goodness that led him to create us with freedom to choose. God is good and he's given us this freedom to love and to create and to dream and to to build and to act and to choose. But with the freedom to make good choices also comes the, the freedom or the option to make bad choices. And sometimes those bad choices yield very painful consequences. Right now, God is allowing humanity to make our own choices. Joshua said it this way. He drew a line in the sand. He said, choose this day what you're going to do, whom you're going to serve. You could serve my God or, or you could choose your own way. And the people on that day chose, chose God and it was, it was well for them. But it's not always that way. I could choose to do good or evil. I could choose to, to bless or to hurt. Sometimes our choices are bad. Sometimes our choices, they hurt ourselves. They hurt the people that we love. God doesn't like that, but God will prompt. God will encourage. God will help. God will counsel. God will do so many things. But in the end, God will not force us to make the decisions that honor him, the decisions that are right and best. We are responsible for our bad choices. God's not responsible for the bad stuff that comes as a result of those bad choices. There's always going to be some Hitler-type person who's going to sweep others' innocence along into their evil plan, their evil work, their evil choices. But those things don't come from God. Have you ever heard it said that things are so much worse now than they were before? A lot of people feel that way. I think it's because we are struggling against the cumulative effects of humanity's bad choices through the ages. And as we move closer and closer to the end of time, we're going to be suffering the the cumulative effects of of all of these bad choices through the ages. I think sometimes we're suffering the effects of choices that were made scores of decades ago. People made a bad choice and it has filtered down in different ways through society, through the ages, throughout time. And it impacts us even today. So you may be thinking, all right, well, I understand that maybe God didn't create the bad stuff, but... Why doesn't God, if he's really good and powerful, why doesn't he just get rid of all the bad stuff? That sounds like a reasonable request. But here's my thought, that God proves his goodness in that he delays in eliminating the bad. And part of me says, no, that's not right. If God was really good, then he would eliminate all of the bad right now. But that doesn't really work because all of us have some bad in us. We're not perfect. If God said at 2 o'clock this afternoon, I'm going to eliminate every source of sin and shame and pain and hurt and wrong in this world, if he's going to do that at 2 o'clock, I mean, would any of us be around at 201? I don't know. I wouldn't because I know I hurt people. I don't want to. I don't like to. I don't mean to. But sometimes in the flesh, I, I do. 
And God knows this. And so it is his goodness that delays in eliminating all of the bad. Because in order to eliminate all of the bad, there has to be a final judgment, a final accounting, a destruction of what is, and a rebuilding of something new, a new heaven and a new earth. The scripture says that God is not slow about his coming, but he's patient and he's waiting for all to come to repentance. And right now, God is preparing a new place. We read of it in John chapter 14, a new world, a new glorious place where there's going to be many mansions. And his desire right now is that you and I in good churches around the world step up and be a salt and light and witness and draw others into a saving relationship with him. That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for us to do the fullness of, all, of our part so that the fullness of humanity would be brought in so that as many as possible will live with him in his kingdom forever and ever in glory. So right now, temporary pain is the price that we pay to give God the time to do the work that he's trying to get accomplished through his people, through his church today. All right, so backing up, God didn't make the bad. And I understand a little bit why God just can't take away all of the bad because that means he'd have to take away all of humanity and he's waiting on us to, to fully respond to him. But why doesn't God, if he's really good, if he's really powerful, why doesn't God just kind of reduce the amount of the bad? I mean, surely he can do that. That sounds reasonable. I want to begin by saying he does. God does help. God does reduce the bad. I mean, we talk about it, prayer requests, we talk about healings, we talk about help, we've talked about new jobs, we've talked about uh, relationships being healed, we've, we've talked about many answers pr to prayers, and, and this is God's intervention, this is God's mercy. So what we're really saying is that, not that God never enters in and never helps, but that we just, we just want more. Well, let's talk about that for a second. God does move. Number four in the outline says, God proves his goodness by avoiding unhealthy parental intervention. You want God to do something about all the bad stuff? Well, what exactly do we want him to do? Roger Kistler, that paramedic who lost his daughter in 1994, he wanted two seconds. And that sounds like a small thing to ask for. But what does that really mean? Did he want God to, to call up his daughter on the phone and delay or distract her? Did he want God to flatten her tire or step on the accelerator or step on the brake? Or, I mean, what did he want? Did he want God to go to the tavern where that drunk guy was before and slap the beer out of the guy's hand? Is that the kind of God that we want? Tina and I lived in Colorado for a time. One time we were in church leading a Bible study class and the airplane crashed about two miles from us. 727, big jet, straight down. Everyone died. So what, what do we say? Do we want God to be the pilot on every aircraft? Do we want God to be the driver in every car? Because I think he could drive better than us, so there'd be no accidents. Is that really what we want? Do we want God to put rubber everywhere on every street, on every playground, so every child that ever falls will never scrape their hands when they fall down? Do we want God to shut our mouths every time we're about to say something that we shouldn't say? Or redesign the structure of the universe so that there's nothing hot, nothing sharp, nothing too cold, nothing with sharp teeth. The reality is, in any scenario where we want God to intervene and protect us from all of the bad stuff, it ends up with unhealthy and even chaotic or destructive consequences. The first consequence, if God was going to intervene like that, is that God would be removing our freedom of choice. In order to remove all of the bad stuff, God would have to intervene at almost every point of my life, there would be no freedom to make personal choices. You and I would only be able to make the choices that were right or perfect and God-honoring. Whenever we were about to make a bad choice, God would jump in and take over in our life. And he would make us do, force us to do what he would want us to do. That's not good parenting. A good parent doesn't interfere in his child's life like that. Think about it. You're driving to work. You're running late. You're going a little too fast. And so God's going to jump in your car or be the co-pilot, and all of a sudden a DMV book is going to appear. He's going to pull you over and, and highlight the parts that he wants you to review and make you promise to drive differently. Ten o'clock at night, you're a little bit hungry. You get up, you walk to the refrigerator, and you try to pull it open, and as some supernatural force is holding it shut. 
little sign says, I will allow you to open this door only if you promise to eat something healthy or to start your exercise regimen that you promised before. I mean, is that the kind of God that we want? I don't think so. I think God is more than a watchdog. God is much bigger, much better than that. In any situation where we, where we would want God to protect us from making bad decisions, it means we're going to lose our freedom to choose. We'll no longer have our own individual personalities. We'll become more like robots than anything else. I think the second thing that happens if God was going to intervene and always make everything good and nice and soft is that by intervening, God would be promoting irresponsibility. That is, if God intervened, we would not have the opportunity to grow and to mature. Parents who always rescue their children from the consequences of bad decisions, they end up raising irresponsible children. Just think of what life would be like if God, if we knew that God would always rescue us. If I didn't worry about my actions, if I drove too fast, if I drove recklessly, if I was a bad father or a bad parent... I knew that God would pick up the pieces and smooth things over and, you know, placate the judge and, and whatever would be necessary to kind of make things right. And in the end, I would not be growing. I would not feel motivated to become responsible or mature. And God knows human nature, and he knows that we need that. We need that accountability. We need that prompting. In the Bible, there's the story of the prodigal son. And the son was irresponsible. He was immature. And he offended his father and he left home and he took his share of the inheritance way before he should have. And he went and lived a life of, of disrespect. In that story, the father doesn't chase the son down. He doesn't force him to come back home. He doesn't force him to do right and invest the money in the right way. He lets the child learn from his poor decisions. But when the child came back and asked for forgiveness, the father was there. And there was healing and restoration and celebration. The child had grown up. And he came back better, wiser, more mature, more responsible, and more committed to do the right thing. That's a good father. And in this story, the story of the prodigal son, the good father is our heavenly father. And he is too good and he loves us too much to jump in and always rescue us from the hurt from some of the consequences of our bad decisions. Now, that is not to say that God says, Gary, you're on your own. Good luck. God does much more than that. But, but sometimes we go through tough times so that we would become wiser, stronger, better believers. Sometimes we go through tough times just so that we'll be connected with someone else who is going through that experience and they're maybe in a hospital room or going through chemo or something and we would have an opportunity to bless them and to witness to them. I think that's part of the reason Chuck is where he is right now because I know wherever he goes, he's bringing the Lord with him and he's telling people about the goodness of Jesus. I think... Another reason that God doesn't kind of jump in, take over, and intervene sometimes is that if God always intervened, the results would be chaos and confusion. In order to protect us from every bad thing, God would constantly have to be overriding our will and suppressing our freedom. We would no longer be free to, to make the choices that we would want to make or to even trust in the basic laws of the universe, the laws of cause and effect, the principles of action and reaction. We would turn the steering wheel right, and God says, no, a, a better thing is to turn left. And so we would turn right, but our car would turn left. Or we would open our mouth to say something, and something totally different would come out because God would determine that the other statement was better, more improved. We would step on the gas, and we would go slower because God would say, no, it's better to, to step on the brake. And we would, we would not have any control. Our lives would be in chaos. I don't know if you saw that old movie with Jim Carrey called Liar, Liar, but even for just a short time, not even having control over what he said, his life was in chaos, and we could just multiply that a hundredfold. That's what our lives would be like if we always expected God to intervene and surround us with some kind of bubble that would insulate us from every bad thing in the world. It just doesn't work. So again, what do we expect? What do we expect God to do in our world? short time ago, a young mother near San Francisco 
had a child with her. The child was swept out in a riptide, and the mother went to save her, and the mother was swept out too. Two people died, and we cry out, why, God, did that happen? In Oakland recently, seven elderly people died in a nursing home fire. And we say, why? Why did that happen? I don't have answers to these tough questions. We'll know more on the other side of glory. I trust God for that. But I do know this, as long as there's water, people are going to drown. And as long as there's fire, people are going to get burned. Bad things happen. And any scenario where we want God to always protect us from that, the result is unhealthy or chaotic intervention. What if cars never crashed if a Christian was driving? Or what if a plane would never go down if there was a Christian on board? We say, well, that sounds like a good thing. Well, if that was really true, then what would happen is Christianity would be reduced to some kind of insurance package. And we really wouldn't respect Christianity for our walk and faith with God. We would respect it for some kind of ability to keep people safe while in the air or in the car. And Christianity and God is so much more than, than that really can't move in a direction that belittles God or Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that God isn't doing anything about helping with the problem of pain and suffering. I think God does a lot to help. And that's what I want us to kind of focus on as we kind of wrap up this message. God's goodness helps us to cope with the bad. Look at this verse from Hebrews 2. It says, For since Christ himself has now been through suffering. He knows what it's like when we suffer, and he is wonderfully able to help. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to to live as we live and to go through every point of temptation, to go through the trials, the ups and downs of life without the protective power of the grace of God. He, He wasn't invincible. He was just a man, and he cried, and he hurt, and he was hungry, and he was thirsty. He bled, and he suffered. He knows what it's like. And because of that, we have a a high priest, the book of Hebrews says, who can sympathize or empathize with all that we go through. And I love how this ends, that he is wonderfully able to help. God knows about suffering. And he loves us enough to to have gotten personally involved in in creation, in in our midst, to go through what we go through. And Jesus didn't come to take away our pain or to explain away our pain, but he came to share our pain and to help us. And he gives us the help of the church and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of fellowship. He gives us the Spirit, which is the helper and the comforter. And through God's love, and through his word, and through the blessings of brothers and sisters in the faith, you will, you will persevere. God will see you through. Recently, there was an accident on a military base, and a helicopter and training exercise went down, and two soldiers died. And one of the soldiers met with the chaplain and said, I don't understand. What happened? Where was God? Where was God when my son died? And the chaplain replied, not sarcastically or flippantly, but in truth, he said, God was exactly where he was when his own son died for the sake of your son and for you and for me. God knows what's going on. God aches with his people. I think God hates what's going on in the world right now. He's longing for the day of redemption when all are called home into his glory. The only thing that's delaying that is there's one more, one more, one more person that needs to give their heart to the Lord. God is never far from his children. His presence is always there. I love the Psalms, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. God is never far from his children. We are called to walk the path of suffering. I don't understand why, but it's our calling. It's part of our Christian walk. It's part of what God has called us to do. He did not say, in the world you may have tribulation. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. When your heart breaks, know that God's heart is breaking with you. He's here. He knows. He cares. God's goodness helps me cope in two ways. Number one, he comforts me. This verse here to the Corinthian church that was going through a hard time, Paul wrote, God is the Father who is full of goodness and mercy. He comforts us every time we are in trouble. I think Paul wrote this word to that church because that church was making a myriad of bad choices. 
And a lot of the trouble and the suffering that they was they were going through was the result of their own bad choices and doings. This was not a church that was particularly oppressed by the Romans or being, you know, they were being thrown to the lions. It wasn't something like that. It was their own infighting and the sin that was alive within their own church. And so he speaks to them of God's mercy and the hope of God's comfort. When hard times come, when the bad things come, draw close to God. Hold on to the promise that God is near. Live one day at a time. If that's too much, one hour at a time. If that's too much, one minute at a time. Just say, God, I know you're here. God, hold my hand. God, see me through. That's who God is. His promise to comfort you and to be with you is sure. Look at this verse. This is sure, that God will strengthen you. 1 Peter 5.10, God will make you strong and will support you. This is what God does. This is part of why Jesus came, so that we would have this promise, so that we would have this gift. God does not leave his people hanging. He doesn't say, good luck, you know, I hope you survive. He is there. God's there to make us strong. God is there to support his people, to carry us, to carry us through those deep waters and difficult times. The truth is God's love will help us cope. It will give us peace. It will help us to persevere. I love the verse from Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, not angels or demons or powers or death or height or anything else in all of creation. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. And even if what we're going through is the result of our own bad choice, our turning our back on God, even if it's that bad, still God is there to extend help and grace and mercy. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, Even if we are faithless, God remains faithful. God does not turn his back on us. God does not move away. God's always there in ever-present help in times of trouble. Just a few more verses. Romans 8.18 says, Our present suffering is less than nothing when compared to the glory that is to come. Sometimes being well positioned to persevere is all about having the right perspective of knowing, yes, it's bad right now, but I know, I know that a blessing's coming. I know that in the end it's going to be okay. I know that this hardship will not last forever. The Old Testament, David in the Psalms wrote of it this way, that tears come in the night, but joy comes in the morning. It was tough and dark and terrible on Good Friday, but Sunday came. And if you're going through deep waters right now, if you're facing tough times, I want you to know that the morning is coming, that Sunday's coming, that a glorification of the saints and eternal life and the paradise in heaven, it's coming. And we have a tremendous future and treasure awaiting us. God is there to hold our hand and to see us through and to help us through times of challenge. And we could know this, 1 Corinthians 1558, that the troubles all around us will soon be gone, but the joys to come will last forever. And there's a time coming where there will be no pain and no darkness and no suffering and no hardship. And God at that place will wipe away every tear and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. And as you keep reading through that verse in Revelation 21 and There's a parallel passage in Revelation 7. It speaks of the Lamb being there in the center of the throne and the saints around the throne and and glories and singing and praising and how good it will be. And not just for a season, but forevermore. Hang in there. Know that God is good even when the bad things happen. And he came in the form of Jesus Christ to show us how to do it, to show us how to persevere and to extend the help of Christian fellowship the ushering in of the New Testament church and the great gift of the Holy Spirit so that we would have the helps that we need to endure and to see things through. Let me pray.